Hello, everybody. This is Kelly Piper with the California Healthcare Foundation. We're so excited to have you join us for our first webinar for the SHOUT program, Supporting Hospital Opioid Use Treatment. And we're going to give maybe one or two minutes since we have a lot of people registered. We want to make sure that people have an opportunity to sign in. So you'll hear silence and then we'll get started in just a minute or two. Welcome. My name is Kelly Piper. I work at the California Healthcare Foundation, and we're an organization that is committed to making healthcare work in California. And we've got a variety of ways that we do that. One of our big initiatives is related to the opioid epidemic and try and reverse the epidemic and lower overdose deaths in California. I'm delighted to um, introduce this webinar, and then I'll be handing it off to my colleagues at UCSF. So if you could advance the slide, I'm just going to go over our agenda. Um, I'm going to be giving a brief welcome, and then Hannah Snyder, who's an addiction fellow with the San Francisco General, the Zuckerberg San Francisco General Hospital, will be going through what the SHOP program is and what it has to offer you. And then Dr. Diana Coppa, who's the head of the residency program at Zuckerberg San Francisco General, also a specialist in addiction and family medicine, will be going through the case for inpatient opioid agonist therapy, why this should be important to us and why we should take it on. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned, we'll have three speakers today, um, Dr. Snyder and Dr. Kaffa, and you can see their credentials here. Um, they are also available if you have questions afterwards. We're going to do our best to allow time for questions um, at the end of the presentation, but if you have questions during the presentation, we really encourage you to use the question box, and some of them you may be able to answer as we go, others we can compile and answer at the end or um, if there's a lot of interest in something, we can always email the group later. The slides and the recordings will be posted within a week on our website at this link, and you'll be able to get, um, again, slides or, or recordings and share that with people who weren't able to attend. Because we have a large number of attendees, everyone is going to be muted um, for the presentation. And if you do have any logistical questions, please chat to the host, and we'll make sure to take care of that. But content questions, we would ask you to be put in the question box. Next. So um, CHCF, as many of you know, has been working on the opioid epidemic for a few years, and we've um, focused on trying to have safer prescribing standards across the state, increasing access to effective um, medication-assisted treatment, and then deploying naloxone as a harm reduction strategy. And when we think about how do you actually make sure the patient is able to get addiction treatment, we think about what would our system be like if every door was the right door, and if someone presented to a special addiction treatment center or primary care center, prenatal care, ED, inpatient hospital, even jail, how could we make sure that this chronic disease is treated as many other chronic diseases are, where if you have uncontrolled diabetes and you show up in any of these points of care, you should be able to either get what you need immediately or get to the right place. And so we have active projects going on to implement addiction treatment in the emergency department where they will start buprenorphine and then it hands that patient off with a warm handoff to an outpatient treatment provider. That practice has been shown to double retention and treatment at 30 days. We've got a project where we're training 25 primary care clinics across the state to integrate addiction into primary care. We're working with a statewide hub and spoke system to um, help coordinate specialty addiction treatment with primary care spokes so that hubs can manage more complex patients and spokes like primary care clinics can manage more stable patients. And we've got on one project in jail where we're trying to work to make sure that um, people are able to get access to buprenorphine, naltrexone, or methadone in a jail setting and then be able to transfer to outpatient treatment. So this project um, focused on the inpatient hospital is a critical piece of the strategy, and it was inspired by a variety of sources, some by our rural colleagues who are starting people on, on say, buprenorphine and then find them withdrawn from buprenorphine in the hospital and at risk of relapse. Another inspiration was the New England Journal of Medicine where a couple of um, infectious disease specialists said, you know, we've seen so many people with 
infected heart valves, infected bones, abscesses, and they keep coming back. Why are we not treating the underlying problem, the problem that's causing all these complications, and get them stable while we have them in the hospital? And that's where we see an incredible opportunity in the hospital setting. But it's complicated. Like any new service, there's a lot of issues related to practicalities of getting medications on formulary, the staff training, doctor training, workflows, staff culture. And that's why we asked San Francisco General to help us because they've been doing this for years and have um, great expertise and we think the rest of the state could benefit. Next slide. So again, our, our goals are to increase access to addiction treatment broadly across the state and the specific goal for this project is to offer inpatient methadone and buprenorphine as a bridge to maintenance. And while naltrexone is a good addiction treatment option for alcohol use disorder and for some populations in opioid use disorder, for a variety of, of reasons, this particular project is just focused on opioid agonist treatment. Um, and we, again, we're going to have this led by our UCSF champions and CHDF is supporting the project and our goals are to build skills and in the three services in inpatient medicine, surgical, and maternity. And again, the goal is to support smooth implementation of these new services. So I'm gonna have the next slide. I'm gonna turn it over to Hannah Snyder. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks everyone for joining us. We're so glad to have you here. Um, so the, the goal of SHOUT is really to empower you as the on-the-ground provider in hospitals and in communities to provide buprenorphine and methadone for folks who you're seeing day to day. Um, and so we'll, we'll be using a couple different components to, to do this. And, and right now you're participating in our webinar series. And we're starting things off today with a, a talk on kind of the case for inpatient opioid agonist therapy, why we think this is important and how we think you can present this to your hospitals and your colleagues. We'll then kind of get into the nitty gritty a little more with a, a talk on actually how do you do induction and how do you do maintenance of buprenorphine and methadone in the hospital. And then follow that with more um, content on how do you manage folks' pain when they're in the hospital, how do you manage them when they're in surgery, and how do you manage them in the setting of pregnancy. Um, and then finally, we'll have a series of talks that are much more implementation focused in terms of what are the logistics of starting these services in your hospital and then allow you to bring barriers that you're facing to us so that we can help you troubleshoot those issues as they arise. Additionally, we know that logistically implementing a project like this can be really tricky. We want to give you the resources that you need to be able to start buprenorphine and methadone in your hospital. So in order to do that, we'll be providing evidence-based um, guidelines that allow you to do induction and maintenance of methadone, induction and maintenance of buprenorphine, and also just to manage people with, with pain. And these have been reviewed by anesthesiology providers, pregnancy providers, inpatient providers, as well as specialists in addiction medicine. All of our guidelines will both address um, care for pregnant patients and pre care for non-pregnant patients. Um, we're also going to be providing patient handouts to help you facilitate the conversations with your patients and help them make decisions about what best treatment options exist for them. We'll be providing frequently asked questions sheets um, with the logistical barriers that we anticipate that most people will be um, meeting. We'll also be providing actually P&T monograph samples for you as a hospitalist or you as a provider to bring to your P&T committee to try to get these medications on formulary for you. And then fin the final component of the toolkit that we're offering is a grand rounds template so that you as the on the ground champion at your hospital can use this presentation to make a pitch to your hospital staff more broadly for the importance of buprenorphine and methadone in patients. didactic information and, and you'll be working very hard on this, but we know that you'll be facing barriers as you try to do this implementation. So we want to help you with through that process. So webinars six and seven that we'll be having in February and March will be much more interactive and allow you to bring questions to us and concerns that you're facing. We'll also have monthly live discussion groups in April to June, as well as a um, newsletter that we'll be sending out with frequently asked questions, new resources as they arise, and relevant articles. And this project is actually specifically targeted towards rural California hospitals. We welcome everybody from across the country to this program, but we do have additional resources that will be specifically available for those hospitals. Um, so if you are currently working in a rural California facility, you'll also have access to one-on-one -on -one coaching with the Project Shout leadership, as well as actual in-person Grand Rounds presentations where we will come and do site visits at your hospital if that's something that's interesting to you. 
So this is a big project. It's a big ask to start buprenorphine and start methadone in the hospital. Um, our hope is that uh, it, folks will be able to get this kind of off the ground by the end of June. And in order to do that, we've got um, the timeline here that you can see. So in November and December, we'll have this didactic webinar series that will really be kind of skills building and giving you the, the information that you need to get things started. Um, our guidelines will be coming out in the next two weeks and should be available for webinar two on November 29th. And over this time, over these two months, we're hoping that you as individual participants can start to really build a team of stakeholders in your hospital who are really interested in moving forward with this project. In January, we'll start to move more into logistical support, so helping you bring it to your pharmacy colleagues, helping you bring it to your administrative colleagues. And over that time, we're hoping that you'll be meeting with leadership and trying to get the medications on formulary. In February and March, we'll be doing much more logistical stuff on removing the barriers that you are facing, and we're hoping that over this time, you'll be able to actually start to pilot buprenorphine and methadone in the hospital, and then come back to us with any concerns that you're having as you get that started. And then in April and June, we'll have ongoing monthly live discussion groups. We'll be offering these hospital grand round presentations. And we think that in June, you should be able to, to really start to fully offer methadone and buprenorphine across the setting of your hospital. Um, so that's kind of it for the project shout overview for today. Um, we will have time for questions at the end. And please feel free to type questions in the question box at any time along the way. Um, and those questions can be uh, about the logistics of Project Shout or about the information that Diana is about to pass on to you. Thanks very much. Great. Uh, this is Diana. So this is, I'm so excited to be part of this project and really eager to see how this uh, spreads throughout the state and, and also throughout the country, because I know we have people from around the country on the call, which actually brings me to my first question. Um, we are gonna launch a couple of poll questions in the right-hand panel of your webinar. Uh, and if you could let us know where actually you're calling from, whether you're calling from within California or out of California, we're gonna go ahead and open up a little poll in the right-hand panel to allow you to do that. Um, the other questions that will help uh, target this talk effectively um, is we are also asking where you typically practice. So do you typically practice in the inpatient setting or the outpatient setting? Um, and then the third question we're gonna ask you is what your typical role is. So are you uh, acting as a medical clinician most of the time, as a hospital administrator most of the time, or a um, social worker, uh, psych psychologist most of the time? So if you could fill out those polls as they open, the first one that's open right now is asking you where you're from, and the other two will open up in the next minute or two. That would be great, and that will help me target this talk a little better and help us understand a little better um, who's in our audience. Thank you for doing that. And I am gonna keep moving through the slides as we open those polls, because I wanna make sure we get through our content with enough time to ask uh, questions at the end. And I figure it doesn't take a lot of brain power to remember what your job is. So I think you can probably focus on both things simultaneously. Um, and opioid use disorder be is becoming a worse problem in this country, despite the fact that if you look at this purple line, we're starting to see a leveling off of opioid overdose deaths involving prescription opioids we continue to see a rise in overall opioid overdose deaths in the country. And in large part, that is because we're seeing a rise in heroin overdose deaths and fentanyl overdose deaths. So this is, oh, the poll is open, so you can't see the slide. Got it, thank you. Um, okay, we will wait for these polls to close then. Um, but I am gonna keep talking about, about the epidemic as we know it. So you're gonna see a slide pop up with a graph in a moment when these polls are closed. Um, and what it's gonna show you is that we're seeing a new increase in heroin deaths um, that we actually haven't seen since we started tracking heroin use in this country. We have not seen an increase in heroin use and we started tracking back in the 70s. So this increase that we're seeing starting in 2010, 2011 is new and totally unusual. And you'll notice that it does coincide with the leveling off of prescription opioid deaths that we saw in 2011. So there is some thought that we may be just moving the epidemic from prescription opioids over to heroin. And so what you see in your hospital 
is lots of people with opioid use disorder still showing up in the hospitals. Um, you'll notice too this recent climb in synthetic opioids that's primarily fentanyl. What we're finding is that fentanyl is making its way into heroin, it's making its way into pills that are calling themselves Vicodin, it's making its way into cocaine and methamphetamine that are being sold on the street. So people are overdosing on fentanyl without even knowing that, that they're taking fentanyl. Um, so this is a whole other epidemic that we're having to tackle right now. But what we see in the hospital is patients coming in who don't have any other contact with the healthcare system, who aren't seeking treatment necessarily for a substance use disorder, but who are having problems related to their substance use disorder in the hospital. I'm gonna wait for this poll to close till I go to the next. Thank you for filling out this information. So it's not gonna be a surprise to most of you who are working in hospitals, which is most of you on this call, that depending on the study you look at and the hospital you look at, eight to 30% of hospitalized patients have a substance use disorder. So it's very common in the hospital. Between 2004 and 2011, we saw a substantial increase in patients admitted with an opioid use disorder specifically. And when we see people in the hospital, we tend as hospitalists only to detect that opioid use disorder about 64% of the time. So we're actually missing a lot of it as well. And you'll notice this number, the 183% increase between 2004 and 2011. If we go back to our slide of the epidemic, it's actually gotten much worse since 2011. So probably today that number is much higher. And as you also know, opioid use disorder complicates hospitalization, right? So 25 to 30% of patients admitted with an opioid use disorder will leave AMA. That's a huge number. It may be because they're experiencing withdrawal. It may be that they have a mistrust of the medical system and are afraid, you know, as soon as they get that antibiotic and feel better, they're out of there because they're afraid of what, what's gonna happen to them in the hospital. It may be that even if we're managing withdrawal, they continue to have cravings withdraw them out of the, which draw them out of the hospital. And then we know that this population is subject to really substantial financial and social pressures which may pull them out of the hospital and out from our care. In addition, withdrawal can complicate our clinical assessment, right? People can be more tachycardic than we expect or diaphoretic in a confusing way because of um, withdrawal. It can also complicate their clinical stability. So it may be somebody with sepsis who's also going through withdrawal has twice the autonomic dysfunction as somebody who is just plain septic. Um, and then I think we've all experienced this, that treatment adherence can be reduced. If somebody is actively dealing with opioid use disorder, they may not want the next needle stick that you have to do for a blood draw, and they may not want to um, stay in the hospital as long as you ask them to. So treatment adherence is a major issue. And we know then that managing people's withdrawal. Now, the standard then, what, what we ought to be doing to manage people's withdrawal is providing either methadone or buprenorphine in the hospital um, to at least save off withdrawal while they're in the hospital. And if we need to, we can also provide adjunctive medications like clonidine, loperamide, um, analgesics, antihistamines to help with some of the withdrawal symptoms. But ideally, we actually are providing methadone and buprenorphine for at least a short course. And that is actually relatively common practice in many hospitals, uh, particularly the methadone, to give a little bit of methadone to get people through their hospitalization. The problem is almost always in most hospitals, we provide that to prevent withdrawal during the course of hospitalization, and then bam, they're out the door with no treatment for their chronic opioid use disorder. Even when we manage people's withdrawal effectively, what we know is that the average length of stay for people with opioid use disorder is much longer than the average length of stay for people who don't have opioid use disorder. So you see here in the y-axis the expected length of stay uh, based on people's admitting diagnosis and complexity. And then in the x-axis, their actual length of stay. And the black line is the line uh, that shows if the actual length of stay were equal to the expected length of stay, we should see our points clustering around
around that line. And instead, we see the points going way out longer into these much longer lengths of stay, particularly for conditions that require a pick line, right? That's a lot of what's driving this. Part of the, the one of the reasons we're doing this talk this way is I want to arm you with the tools that you'll need to talk with your colleagues and hospital administrators about this issue so that you can be an effective champion for this in your in your settings. This kind of data, I think, length of stay and hospital readmissions are the things that really drive administrators in many settings. Um, and so I think this is really compelling for, for hospital administrators. Um, the same study that is cited Order, which is not, not surprising. The other thing that I think is really important to us as clinicians, uh, maybe not quite as compelling to some administrators, depending on the setting, is that opioid-related death after discharge skyrockets in the month after discharge. And these are almost all overdoses. So for a patient who has not been admitted to the hospital, their risk of opioid overdose per month is two per thousand. The day after they get discharged from the hospital and for the month after their discharge, that risk jumps to 31 per thousand per month. And then it declines over time. So people are very vulnerable to death right after we discharge them. And I think that's a clue that we, that again, there's this chronic illness that we are just not, not getting them into treatment for that kills them after they leave our hospital. Fortunately, we have medications that save lives. So opioid agonist therapy works. I'm gonna show you data from a recent meta-analysis, and I know these kinds of data are really hard to see and digest, uh, but let me just call your attention to these diamonds that I have circled. So the white diamond is the mortality rate for um, patients in methadone studies who were not treated with methadone, so patients out of treatment. The blue diamond is patients who are receiving methadone. patients who were in methadone maintenance therapy. So it absolutely saves lives. Similarly, we have some studies looking at mortality rates among patients on buprenorphine, which also show a reduction in mortality of probably about 50%. Now, you'll notice, and we're not gonna spend a bunch of time talking about this unless it comes up in the questions, but you'll notice that the population of patients in the methadone studies overall had higher mortality. The population of patients in buprenorphine studies overall had lower mortality. That's because historically we have tended to put more complex um, patients in methadone and more and patients with fewer comorbidities in buprenorphine. That may no longer be the case. And so if we look at more recent studies, we may start to see less of that differential, but that is historically how it, how it has been. In addition to saving lives, opioid agonist therapy prevents all kinds of morbidity and promotes recovery. So we know that OAT reduces injection and illicit drug use, increases abstinence, promotes return to work, return to family obligations. You see this wheel on the right is kind of a wheel of how, how people in recovery describe the experience of recovery. And we know that OAT promotes that kind of holistic uh, re-engagement with community that recovery represents. for which people are so often hospitalized, and reduces criminality. So all good things. What does not work is a brief medically assisted withdrawal. This is what we used to call detox, right? You put someone on methadone for seven days or 28 days or 60 days. It kind of doesn't matter how many, how many days. If you're doing a relatively short course of opioid assisted treatment, what you see is that people just drop right back into opioid use. And by the end of a month, you typically have 80 to 90% of patients having relapsed. And this has been shown over and over again in study after study. So we don't recommend these short courses of detox as effective therapy. Similarly, we really don't recommend abstinence-based treatments. So I think often those of us who aren't as familiar with addiction medicine are under the impression that the best treatment you can offer someone is residential rehab, for example. And that turns out to be not so effective relative to the medications we have. The medications we have 
40 to 60, well, it's more like actually probably 60 to 70% of people will stay in care and in treatment with the medication. Whereas these abstinence-based therapies, um, again, relapse rates are in the 80 to 90% range. Um, at the beginning, it was mentioned that we aren't going to be covering much about naltrexone uh, in this So it tends to have a pretty high dropout rate from care. Um, and so we think of it as kind of a second line treatment. The opioid agonist therapies, methadone and buprenorphine, we think of as first line treatment. Naltrexone, a second line if for some reason you can't use those. And then last would be abstinence-based therapies in terms of efficacy. So let's just do a little thought experiment as a group. If you were to admit a patient with osteomyelitis, and discover that that patient had uh, hyperglycemia, diabetes, would you discharge the patient without initiating treatment for the diabetes? And the answer is obviously no. We all know that if we did that, we'd have a patient who was readmitted maybe in a couple months, maybe sooner, for some complication from diabetes. We know that we wouldn't get a good handle on the osteomyelitis, that we didn't get some kind of handle on the diabetes. Um, and similarly, similarly, taking a patient who's admitted for osteomyelitis because of injection drug use and not treating the injection drug use sets us up for a cycle of recurrent readmission and potentially death. I think one of the reasons we haven't historically initiated treatment for patients with opioid use disorder is that we haven't been convinced as a, as a medical community that addiction is really a chronic disease. Um, so I wanted to take uh, just a few moments to talk this through. I think probably most of us on this call are on board with the notion of addiction as a chronic disease. But again, you may find yourself in a situation where you're trying to convince others, and I want to give you some, some thoughts about, about how to think about it. So we're not going to go into all of the ways that addictive substances impact um, neurobiology and neuroanatomy, but I do want to just highlight a couple of things. So the nucleus accumbens, which is the red shaded circle area here in this diagram, is the reward and drive center of the brain, right? So when something pleasant happens, dopamine gets released in the nucleus accumbens, and you have an experience of pleasure. And not just that, you have an experience of drive. You have an experience of, okay, this is something I want to do again. And the next time that thing is presented to you, you recall with your hippocampus, how wonderful it was the first time, and you seek out the experience again, right? So when we eat food, we have a dopamine release in the nucle nucleus accumbens. When we see in a person we're attracted to, we get a dopamine release in the nucleus accumbens. And that's essentially how our species has continued to survive, is that we sort of follow these normal biological drives uh, using our nucleus accumbens. The problem is that when you take an addictive substance, you get massive release of dopamine in the nucleus accumbens. So your natural uh, sort of animal drives get superseded and hijacked. Take these drugs um, for a long period of time or repeatedly, you can actually get changes in structural changes in the nucleus accumbens and hippocampus related to recurrent drug use. You also get marked changes in receptor population in that area, so that the kinds of dopamine receptors that exist in nucleus accumbens of someone with substance use disorder are different than the, dopious, the dopamine receptors of those of us who don't have substance use disorder. Um, this means that these patients actually don't experience necessarily pleasure from the normal dopamine surges that all of us get as we go through our day, and instead are in kind of a constant state of dysphoria that's only relieved by taking medications that cause these giant uh, dopamine releases. The other thing we see in people with substance use disorder is diminished activity in the blue and green regions, the prefrontal cortex and the orbitofrontal cortex. That diminished activity means less executive function and less impulse control. So in addition to having an overactive drive system, there's an underactive executive function and impulse control system. So all of that leads us to think of uh, addiction as a chronic brain disease. 
in which the brain has actually been impacted by this drug and, and in some ways harmed by it. The other thing that I think about when I think about addiction as a chronic disease is, is like, let's put this in context of other chronic diseases, right? When a person's in treatment for a substance use disorder, a typical relapse rate, depending on the treatment, is probably in the 40 to 60% range per year. It's not that different from the typical relapse rate for someone whose type 1 diabetes is well controlled. Like what percent of people are going to have a high A1C at some point in the year because they stopped taking their medications quite like they were supposed to? It's actually about the same percentage. Same for hypertension, same for asthma. The difference is when someone with substance use disorder has a relapse, it's a disaster, right? It, it may impact their job, it may impact their family, it, it impacts their life very differently than a hypertensive relapse where you just have high blood pressure for a few months. Um, so we see it more, but it's, it's not that different in frequency. Back to our diabetes thought experiment. Do you think of diabetes as a disease? It's behaviorally mediated, right? What you do absolutely impacts your diabetes control and your risk of developing diabetes. It's environmentally mediated. Where you live impacts whether you're going to get diabetes and how it's gonna be managed. It's socially mediated. Who you know, what the social norms are, impacts your risk of diabetes. It's politically mediated, right? Food policy, food subsidies, um, school lunch policies all impact people's risk of developing diabetes. And it's culturally mediated. What do, what do your people eat? What is, what is the culture around exercise in your family? It's not just an organic pancreatic disease, but we're able to kind of comprehend that a complex social disease, a complex socially mediated disease can exist and can still require medical treatment. And I use that same frame to understand addiction as a complex disease. Yes, it's also behaviorally mediated. It's also socially mediated, who you hang out with, what you're exposed to. It's political, right? Which drugs are legal and which are illegal makes a huge difference in how addiction manifests and whether it even develops. Um, it's environmental, it's cultural, there's a strong emotional component. That's all true and it's genetically mediated. 50% of your risk for developing a substance use disorder is genetic. That's huge, right? That's a very biological phenomenon. It's pharmacologically mediated, right? It's a chemical, a chemical occurrence, and it is an organic brain disease. And I think we can hold all of those truths simultaneously because um, we know that that's what complex chronic disease looks like. So then the next question really is, well, is the hospital the right place to start treatment? And I think in many ways, it's an optimal place to start treatment. So patients are often really ready for change in the hospital, right? They've seen something terrible happen to their bodies and they feel like maybe this is the time to get out. The other thing I wanna highlight is the role that we as hospital-based providers can have in helping patients realize their self-worth and get in touch with some hope for change. So this last bullet I have under the, under the first heading, respect and kindness from providers, the amount of self-loathing and shame that is part of addiction, I think is really hard to comprehend unless you've experienced it or had some, some very real conversations with people who are in addiction. Um, and often the narrative that's going through people's minds is, you know what, I can't stop, I tried to stop and it didn't work and it's not worth it anyway and, and, and I'm not worth it, so why bother? Like that's the kind of stuff that's keeping people in their cycles. And if we in, as providers can sit down, make eye contact with someone and say to them, you know what, I can see how strong you are, I can see your potential and I think you can do this and I think you're worth it. That kind of conversation has so much power for helping people come out of their addiction. And some people are living lives where there's nobody, nobody around to have that conversation with them, except maybe the person they meet in the hospital. Uh, a study published this year looking at this found that 67% of hospitalized patients who use drugs want to quit or cut back. And 44% of people with opioid use disorder had a strong interest in medication treatment. So when I, I'm not advocating that we all go and like convince every single patient to get on these medications, 
But for those 50% of people who are who want help, it, it, it shouldn't be that complicated to provide them the help that they're asking for. Another big question that comes up is, wait a minute, is this even legal, right? So if you want to use methadone to treat addiction, you have to do it from a federal, federally licensed opioid treatment program or a methadone clinic. And if you want to use buprenorphine to treat addiction, you need to have a DEA waiver, which requires eight hours of additional training for physicians or 24 for NPs and PAs. Fortunately, the DEA makes exceptions for hospitalized patients. So if you're admitted for, to the hospital for any reason other than addiction, cellulitis, endocarditis, your providers, we as physicians and NPs, can dispense methadone and buprenorphine to treat the addiction in the hospital. So we can continue on the medication that people came in on and we can induct people on new medications and that's totally legal, explicitly protected by the DEA. Um, there's another law that I just want to touch on even though it's not entirely relevant to what we're talking about. I think it's important for our call. That allows us to dispense methadone and buprenorphine in an outpatient setting. So typically an emergency room or an urgent care clinic, to someone who's experiencing withdrawal. We can do that and you dispense one day at a time and you can actually do it for up to three days without a, de a waiver and without being an opioid treatment program. It's important for people to know that that is an option, that it's legal. So we have some studies on initiating methadone and buprenorphine in the hospital. So here's one of the uh, earlier studies of methadone initiation in the hospital in which they found 288 people with opioid use disorder and asked them if they wanted treatment. 30% said, no, I don't want that. Some because they didn't want any treatment and some because they didn't want methadone. But 70% of people said, yeah, okay, I'll try methadone. That sounds like a good idea. Um, of those people who started methadone, about 59% stayed in treatment. So they went to the methadone clinic and after discharge and got hooked up with care. About 41% didn't follow up with methadone clinic after discharge. So I guess we could debate whether that's a good number or a bad number, but my, my take on it is that if we can get 59% of 70%, that's still a good 40% of patients with opioid use disorder who came into the hospital who we are connecting to long-term care after discharge. And those are lives changed and life saved. Similarly for buprenorphine. So there was recently a study published in 2014 where they took patients and started them on buprenorphine in the hospital to manage withdrawal and either linked them to long-term care after discharge or uh, did a short-term detox for them. And you can see in the first bars here, so blue is the number of patients who went into medication-assisted therapy after discharge. In the linkage group versus the detox group, no surprise, the linkage group was much more likely to receive care. At six months, many people had dropped out of care. It's actually more than we usually see dropping out of buprenorphine care. So some clue that maybe this, maybe the retention isn't as great when we start in the hospital and something we need to work on. But still, still that 16% of people whose lives are totally different than they would have been. If you look at the total number of days in MAT, again, you can see a big difference between the people who are linked to care and the people who are discharged. Now, this is a little bit harder to read, but I think it's really, really important. So I want to I wanna show you this from the same study. In the x-axis is the number of people or the percent of patients who had days where they used opioids. So you can see, I'm going to show you here, I'm, the arrows are pointing to the percent of patients who had zero days of opioid use, okay? And you can see over on the right, the percent of patients who had 30 days of opioid use. And you can see there are differences between the linkage and detox group there too. And you can see that the mean and median days of use were really different between the linkage group and the detox group. So even though people weren't necessarily in care at six months, we see substantial changes in the way that people were using after that linkage. 
And then like, what's the worst thing that happens? The worst thing that happens is that we start somebody on treatment and they don't connect with care after discharge and they return to use. And what we know is that in that case, the patient has at least retained tolerance to opioids and is probably less likely to overdose uh, in that month after discharge because we haven't uh, eliminated their tolerance to opioids. The other thing that happens in those cases is that the patient has at least had um, an opportunity to try these medications and see what they think. So I'm gonna ask you another poll question here. And the question is, how many times do you think a typical person needs to try to quit before they succeed at quitting? I see we've got some ringers in the audience. Great. Okay. Let's go ahead and close the poll. Thank you. Good. So the answer is uh, seven. And two thirds of you got that right. Yeah. So it takes about seven quit attempts typically um, to get off of, the, uh, of a drug. And that includes tobacco. We typically see about seven quit attempts. And what's interesting is that your chance of succeeding on a given quit attempt actually increased the more quit attempts you've had in the past. So it's not as though trying something and having that work means that's the end of the road for you. That means that you have had an opportunity to learn about what are my triggers, what works for me, what doesn't work for me, what do I wanna try next? You may have had a week or two to get some part of your life together. There's still utility in those quit attempts. The other thing I just want to put out there um, as something we should be working on as we work on buprenorphine and methadone prescribing in the hospital is harm reduction. So we advocate for universal naloxone prescribing. Anyone with an opioid use disorder should have naloxone in their house. And that's something we can, um, or in their non-house if they don't have a house. And that's something we can prescribe on discharge for people. Uh, it's also really critical to connect people with needle exchange resources in as much as they're available in your setting. Um, and if needle exchange resources aren't available, then to take it upon ourselves to do a little bit of teaching about safe injection practices, right? So reminding people how important it is to use clean needles and work, so meaning the cottons and the spoons and things people use, um, to avoid injecting alone so that they do have someone to help them out if they do overdose, and to use test doses. So that is to take a small amount of whatever drug they're um, taking, test its potency before taking what feels like a full dose. And I think we can, we can highlight the risk associated with fentanyl um, in many of the drugs that people are buying as a reason to really be careful about test dosing these days. And I want to also just take a minute to reflect on the language I've been using throughout this talk. So instead of saying opioid abuse or drug abuse, I've been saying opioid use disorder. Um, the term substance abuse was actually removed from the DSM-5 when it was rewritten it, for a few reasons, but one of the main reasons was the stigma that comes with using a word like abuse, which is quite violent, um, to describe a disease. So we're really trying to move away from stigmatizing language. So I don't say addict, I say person with addiction or person with substance use disorder. Uh, I don't say tweaker and junkie and those kinds of, there, there have actually been studies showing that if you present a case to a psychologist using stigmatizing language, that psychologist is less likely to recommend treatment than if you present the same case using non-stigmatizing language. So this is, this is something we're really working on in the field of addiction, is making sure that we're using language that gives our patients the best chance of getting uh, the respectful care that they deserve. Okay, a couple more questions for you here. Um, first question is, where are you right now in your hospital around methadone prescribing? Uh, is it not on formulary? You occasionally, you can prescribe it, but only short courses. Um, or you have, you have a clear discharge path for maintenance therapy. 
or maybe you're already doing all of this. So it looks like, yeah, so it looks like more hospitals are able to prescribe it for patients who are already on it, um, which makes sense. And then some are able to start it, but don't have a clear path for discharge, which I think is, yeah, that makes sense too. That's the most common. Okay, good. So good. Um, we have some work to do, but we're not starting in a, in a terrible place. Similarly then for buprenorphine, same question. So more common, it looks like, for buprenorphine not to be on formulary. But we're seeing similar patterns, it looks like, that we are often prescribing it to continue maintenance therapy when people are admitted, um, a little less frequently starting it, and pretty rarely having a clear path for discharge to maintenance therapy. I think that's all our votes. Great, great. That's really helpful. Um, and then we have one last question. I'm going to pull up here. Yeah. So, what is your sense of how important it is to provide these therapies in the hospital? All right. Well, obviously, you gave up an hour to do a webinar. So, <laughs> so the very important number is very high. Okay. are still voting, so I'll give it a little bit more time. Great. Thank you. That's that's really helpful to get a sense of where people are at so that we can support people in getting where they want to be. There we go. Okay. So yeah, so what are the next steps then? It sounds like many of you do have some of this already happening, which is great. Um, what we found with hospitals that are trying to move to the next level is that as with so many things, the first step is to find your champion. The next step is to develop a team. Um, getting hospital leadership buy-in is pretty critical. Uh, having a pharmacist on your team, super helpful as you're working with formulary issues. Um, and then think about nursing and social work on your team, right? Uh, social work may be critical for making those discharge plans and nursing may be critical or helpful for uh, managing induction. Sometimes you wanna be scoring patients withdrawal, for example, much like we do for alcohol and having nursing helping out with that can be helpful. Not necessary, but helpful. The other big thing that it sounds like is gonna be the major thing for many of the people on this call is developing partnerships with where you can discharge your patients who you start on methadone and then primary care providers or addiction providers who provide buprenorphine so that you can discharge your buprenorphine patients to those providers. Those partnerships may be the place where many of you um, are gonna start really building the next step of your program. And we'll work with you on uh, developing an inpatient prescribing protocol that works for your system. We have some model protocols that we think can help with that. So that is, the end of the content for today and i'm going to turn it back over to hannah who has been collecting your questions yeah and i'd encourage you to continue submitting questions we do have about 10 minutes left uh, for any questions that you might have either about project shout or about the, the content that diana um, presented um, so just to review uh, kind of next steps um, if you're a hospitalist or your maternity care provider please join us and help get this on formulary at your hospital if you're an outpatient provider and you have concerns for how your, your patients are cared for when they're in the hospital, please join us as well and we can help you partner with local hospital organizations. You can act as the local champion to really get these really important medic maintenance medications started for your patients so they can be bridged to life-saving outpatient care. Um, so to review what we have available for you is uh, this ongoing webinar series. Um, our next event is going to be on the 29th and that'll get a little more into the nitty gritty of how you actually do induction and maintenance. We've got our evidence-based guidelines that'll be coming out in the next two weeks, toolkits for, with resources for our implementation, and as well as some logistical support and grand rounds.
And then um, please let us know if you have any questions or concerns. So you can see up on the screen here, this is our project email. Any logistical questions, any subject matter questions, let us know and we're happy to help you out. And we'll aggregate all that email into our newsletter. If you want more information, please go to our website and uh, please also sign up for the program as a whole to uh, receive ongoing email updates. Um, and then finally, um, we will shortly be sending out an email in the next couple of days. It will come with a needs assessment. I know you may have received quite a few surveys from us, but we do think this is really important to just get a sense of what can best help you. What can we do to really help you out on the ground? Um, once you fill that out, we'll, we'll send along a link to our webinar recording as, long, as well as the PDF of the slides that Diana presented today so that you can use those in your own hospital, some key research articles, and the link to the registration for the next webinar. Um, first question is um, coming from Sky Lee. Um, it is, can you get naloxone over the counter or without a prescription from all pharmacies or just the ones in California or in the Bay Area? And how much would it cost? Great. Yeah, naloxone. Um, you can get naloxone without a prescription in California, it is a behind the counter medication, meaning the pharmacist still has to be a little bit involved. So a little bit like plan B for those of you who are familiar with that. Um, it is expensive without a prescription. So it costs about $140, $150, I think, without a prescription. And not all pharmacies are doing it. In fact, most are not. CVS has taken it up pretty well. Um, Walgreens, which is kind of dominant in our area, has not really figured it out as far as we can tell. So I think it's highly variable and it's probably not the optimal path uh, for patients since it's so expensive. And also high sky. Um, so we, I'd also like to add to that, that um, the, the intranasal naloxone, the brand name Narcan is available for $140. Um, the, the syringe of naloxone can be available much cheaper without a prescription at about $30. We still think it's expensive and we still think that the majority of the time the best idea is for you as a provider to write that prescription so that it will be covered by the, pers the person's insurance, particularly if they're on Medi-Cal in the state of California, it should always be free. Um, next question. Um, my hospital's hospitalists are going to want a reference that reassures them that the DEA is fine with the prescribing of methadone. Do you have a reference or letter from the DEA to share with us? Yeah, yeah. On that slide, I actually put um, the reference for the exact page in the DEA uh, guidelines, but we will also send that out in an email to you. We can send you a link to, the, to that online. Does that sound right? Can you speak a little, Diana, to the option of um, telemedicine as an ongoing option for treatment? So for example, through Bright Heart Health and other organizations like that, um, is, is that an option for our patients coming out of the hospital? Yeah, you know, I uh, don't work directly with Bright Heart Health and can't, I don't know exactly what their capacity is. The, the real question after discharge is how quickly somebody can get in. You do want somebody to get in within a few days to a week, um, but that may mean that telemedicine is actually the optimal treatment strategy if access is more, um, more available that way. So I think it's a really intriguing idea to support really primary care providers in providing um, buprenorphine for people and potentially for being kind of the, the primary addiction providers. So I think that's really interesting to explore. And I haven't talked with Bright Heart Health about doing this, but we certainly could. Um, limited access to outpatient care. So I'm not sure, one methadone provider or one buprenorphine provider? They wrote methadone. Um, yeah. If, I think that's a huge challenge, uh, particularly around methadone. It's hard to start a methadone clinic if you don't have one. Um, if you do have a methadone clinic and can develop a pathway to that clinic, that can be extremely helpful. So here in our setting, um, the methadone clinic here actually prioritizes hospital discharges because they recognize the risk associated with that transition. So you may be able to set that up with your local methadone clinic. If you have a shortage of buprenorphine providers, that too is frustrating, but I think a little more amenable to 
change, right? It's actually not that hard to get online and do a buprenorphine waiver training, become a buprenorphine provider. And there are a lot of support systems out there to support people in becoming more effective uh, buprenorphine providers. So that may just be a question of looking for uh, primary care clinics in the area that might be willing to take this on and partner with you um, and looking for a champion there to get buprenorphine started in your local primary care clinic. This is also a place to connect people with the hub and spoke system that uh, Kelly described early on. So throughout California now, we're trying to set up support structures um, called hubs that will help primary care clinics called spoke in providing buprenorphine really throughout the state. So um, if you're in, a look, in an area like that, look for a couple of champions and see if you can connect them with CHCF. Great, our next question is about kind of selling this to hospital leadership in the C-suite and um, asking one, if we have any particular resources for that, um, and two, for, for example, is this a potential revenue stream for the hospital? Yeah. This is important. Um, so we are hoping that we that these slides would be helpful to you in that. Um, I also, each of the slides has references to, I think, key articles, and we can also send those out. Um, the, the slide about length of stay has a reference to a really useful article uh, where they examined um, readmission rates and length of stay among people with opioid use disorder and then the impact of an intervention for opioid use disorder on reducing those. And I think in the end, that's the pitch for hospitals. The reimbursement, you know, you get reimbursed based on a person's admitting diagnosis. So it's not that helpful for reimbursement. What it's helpful for is reducing length of stay, which increases the cost of people's care, and reducing readmissions, which may not be reimbursed, right, if they're, if they're readmissions in too short a period. So that's the pitch for hospitals, and I think we have a really strong pitch for that. I would start with the impact study, um, this reference on that length of stay slide, um, and, and I think you'll find other stuff from there. But if that more studies to try to help with that pitch as well. Great, we've got a couple questions about the DEA regulations. You mentioned specifically about emergency rooms. Um, so is there a limitation on the length of days that an ER doctor or a hospitalist is allowed to write for either of these medications on discharge? And then what's the difference between that and the dispensing that they can do by day by day? Great, yeah. Uh, so there are two different things, and I appreciate you bringing up the discharge prescription, actually, that's important. When you're writing a discharge prescription, which is different than dispensing. When you're writing a discharge prescription, that person does need to have the DEA waiver for buprenorphine because that has suddenly become an outpatient prescription. So you will need someone in your system who can write those prescriptions. In our system, <clears throat> we have a buprenorphine pager. Whenever a patient is admitted on buprenorphine, if the team doesn't have a DEA waiver, they can call uh, one of us and, and we'll call in that prescription for them. So that's how we've done it. Um, but yeah, so that is a difference when you're, when you're discharging. The 72 hour uh, compassionate use exemption requires that you dispense the medication, not that you prescribe it. So three days you're allowed to dispense it from the ED or urgent care, um, but not to prescribe it. There is a whole program through CHCF of um, setting up buprenorphine induction protocols in emergency rooms. So there are protocols around actually starting people on buprenorphine in emergency rooms, which involve dispensing um, a few tablets to people right there in the hospital and then, and then hooking up with outpatient care from there. Um, yeah, and CHCF has, has some good protocols around that. Okay, well, we're just about out of time. I'll just comment briefly on a couple of the more logistical questions that came up. Um, so we got a couple of questions around the possibility of CME availability for this course, which is something that we are working on. We don't have that available right now. Um, and that'll be a part of our needs assessment. So please tell us how important that is to you in the needs assessment, and we'll continue to work on getting you access to that. Um, we got a couple questions about determining whether methadone or buprenorphine was the best treatment for um, your individual patient. And what I'd say to that is um, that is a, it's a 
complex question. It's, it's difficult to tease out patient by patient, and we'll be really digging into that into a lot of depth um, in our upcoming webinar on the 29th. Um, if you have questions in the meantime, feel free to approach us about those, and we'll also publish that information in our guidelines that we'll be sending out shortly. Um, and I believe that's all the time that we have for questions today. Um, thank you all so much for joining us on this webinar, and thank you so much for joining us here in Project Shout. Um, we're really looking forward to this ongoing partnership. Thank you.